Hi, um, uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Yvonne Lafort, um, and Yvonne and I have known each other for a very long time. She uh, is a um, Canadian and New Zealand citizen, as well, I'm an Australian and a Canadian citizen, and we've both been working in um, breastfeeding for a very long time. Um, Yvonne, would you just, just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, um, so share some information. Sure. Thank you, Carol, for asking me to speak with you today. But as Carol mentioned, I'm a Canadian trained family doctor, and I've spent most of my professional life in New Zealand. And I'm a fellow of both the Canadian College and the, the New Zealand College of GPs. And uh, I first became uh, interested in breastfeeding medicine um, after the birth of my second son and had experienced firsthand what it's like to have breastfeeding issues and to get the help you need from an experienced IBCLC. And that was while I was living in Calgary. And I was very fortunate to get to know a real pioneer in this area, Dr. Evelyn Jan. Mm. And uh, by working in her practice in osmosis, I actually ended up working in her breastfeeding clinic and learning how much of a need this whole area of medicine was. At that time, we're talking like the late 90s, but. I continue to believe that this area is a very undervalued um, part of our medical education. So it opened up a lot of new doors for me. And um, when I moved to New Zealand in 2000, I continued my interest in it. And eventually I've set up my own clinic, um, Milford Breastfeeding Clinic in Auckland. And it's been operating probably in the last 20 years sort of evolving into what I have at the moment when we work with another IBCLC and we see people from all over the city and from the outskirts of the city and truly from around New Zealand that come for breastfeeding help. Now that's a, you've sort of answered my first question that I was going to ask about how you got on this path, which is great. Um, how, how, how do you see, um, or what does your practice look like? Because you you have specialized uh, in reality um, in breastfeeding medicine, right? Yes. So I, as I said, I did family medicine. So included in our family medicine training in uh, Canada was a, a large uh, chunk of obstetrics and another large chunk of pediatrics. So this was something I was quite happy to continue when I moved to New Zealand in general practice. And so I evolved my practice into less and less time in general practice and more and more time in breastfeeding medicine. So at, at the moment, I am limited a little bit by the availability of the IBCLC, but we, I do two full days of breastfeeding medicine and two half days of general practice, approximately. We also respond when there's urgent cases that need to be seen and we'll extend our hours or move into another day. Um, yeah, so I have a separate area from the other doctors in the, the the clinic and with the uh, time of pandemic, it's been really great because I've been able to completely isolate myself from the general practice part of the mm -hmm. building and have people come straight into my room and be able to disinfect everything after they leave. So uh, yeah, it's an advantage to be physically separated. And um, yeah, it's been really, it's been really great. That's, that's excellent. Um, I've got a, the next question um, I'm going to ask is sort of like, uh, you know, um, you know why is breastfeeding education important to doctors and i i've i've been to um, new zealand and spent time with you and seen you um working to support a lot of younger um residents a lot of the younger doctors coming um uh, coming up in you know, in the field um and you've guided them a lot with uh, with breastfeeding education so for doctors in general because we've got pediatricians, obstetricians, family doctors, who are all anesthesiologists, everybody who's working with breastfeeding um, uh, parents. Um, uh, you know, so why would you say breastfeeding education is important to them? I think everybody in the field of medicine is quite quick to admit that they receive very little information or lecture or practical help about uh, working with breastfeeding moms and babies or parents and babies. 
in their aspect of medical practice. So uh, as you know, Carol, I'm part of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, which is an 800 member international organization of doctors. And as you say, there are surgeons, there are family medicine, there's pediatrics, there's every discipline rep represented. So we all interact with breastfeeding parents and their infants. So every one of us has an opportunity to either have a positive influence or to unfortunately have a negative influence on uh, that relationship. So uh, right from the very beginning, I'm very, I was been very happy to do educational sessions for doctors. And uh, one of the projects that I'm extremely proud of that's really gone very well is to establish a peer review group for the uh, Royal College of GPs here in New Zealand. And we have uh, 14 members and 12 of them are members of the college and two are actually pediatric trainees who recognize they're not getting any education and want to be part of our peer review group. So regularly we explore new literature as it's published, clinical cases that we had difficulty with and just share information that we might have heard or read about or if we've attended a conference we share you know what we've learned from these conferences so that's been going for almost four years and it's just been wonderful it's all done online we're pre pre-pandemic online because we're spread out all over the country yeah. and uh, so yeah or anytime I actually have been asked to do breastfeeding education I respond positively and I'm really happy to go into communities but I always find you have to start right at the beginning, beginning. because people we don't know where people are. You know, when we look at, say, the study that Catherine Pound did in 2014, the Canadian study, mm -hmm. uh, looking at breastfeeding confidence, beliefs, and attitudes among doctors, and she found that, you know, a relatively good number, 67% of pediatricians and a similar number of family doctors actually felt confident about their knowledge in breastfeeding. But the proviso was their knowledge was gained through their own life experience rather than formal education. So you think, what other organ system would we be dependent on what happened to us to mm -hmm. learn about? Yeah. And another little thing that indicates that doctors are deficient in their education is the Dr. Milk Facebook group, which has 28,000 doctor mm -hmm. mothers members, and they're not simply sharing their woes about breastfeeding. They're looking for evidence-based information yeah. to help them, and then in turn for them to be more confident in their clinical practice. So you don't have to look very far or deeply to realize there's a definite need for more medical education on breastfeeding. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably one of the the, the really important things. Um, I've worked in, with McGill over the years, um, and we've you know, tried to sort of um, improve the education. And there is just such a, a need that needs, you know, that, um, and a desire to have more knowledge. So, and I know as everyone's going towards um, uh, ba the, the baby friendly um, uh, um, initiative and, uh, and New Zealand is very strong in this area. So um, you know, if you're looking at baby friend, the baby friendly initiative, and there's also the community um, portion of it, and the international code. How um, how can you see doctors can be um, involved or and supportive of uh, um, this process? The um, the unfortunate part is those of us who work in the community are a bit disconnected, mm -hmm. and we don't see infants until they're six weeks of age. So our maternity care is pretty well completely covered by our midwifery what workforce. Mm -hmm. So it is a little bit of a problem there, but I think to make people aware that when and if a mother and infant do present in those first six weeks, we need to know that the whole uh, code exists mm -hmm. and we need to make our environment free of commercial advertising that may support in a very subtle way mm -hmm. the use of breast milk substitutes. But I think um, just even listening to people as a, as a, one of the few doctors who does get to see these mums in those first six weeks. It's obvious that it's a bit hit and miss, even with mm -hmm. our good accredited hospitals. If your baby happens to be born on a weekend or a long weekend or the holiday period coming up in December, the, um, the likelihood of having temporary nursing staff increases. And, you know, the policies are not always held as great when they have a temporary staff member in. But I think the big one for me is the unnecessary introduction of breast milk substitutes in very early days. And then that whole path is hard to recover from. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to get our IBCLCs right there at the forefront to say, wait a minute, we can do other things besides immediately introduce formula. Mm -hmm. um, given that babies may need some extra feeding, mm -hmm. uh, there are, as you and I both know, there's a whole strategy that could be enacted. But I do think that, um, that a lot of what I do is undoing a few of the shortcomings that have occurred in those in the uh, institutions. But as I said, most doctors are disconnected from that uh, mm -hmm. in the community, but um, it's still important that we know. And I think particularly the code of marketing breast milk substitutes is very much a part of how, um, how, we, how we practice. Uh, very frequently we get invitations to courses that are sort of uh, disguised as uh, say a course on allergies in babies mm -hmm. which sounds like gosh I better go to that one and then you realize that it's definitely something that's slanted towards not breastfeeding as a oh. role you know in controlling and preventing or what have you with allergies and sponsored through uh, uh, companies who make breast substitutes so we have to be on the alert and the lookout for those sort of things because we know that if we're seeing a supporting anything that's not um, evidence-based or that is actually marketing something, we are actually endorsing it indirectly mm -hmm. as healthcare leaders. And we know on the opposite side that if we endorse breastfeeding and we really promote it among our, our the patients and the people we come in contact with, people listen to us, just like the anti and the smoking campaign. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of power to say, uh, to direct people and to influence their actions. Yeah. I think that's uh, it's come out quite often with research that um, uh, as, as a nurse or as an IBCLC, a lot of times we can guide families um, in a whole you know, positive direction and everything can be unraveled um, simply by the words of a doctor um, uh, and, so, and often misguided. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's working with families, perhaps prenatally as well um, and within the communities of ensuring if things didn't go so well with their first baby, having them really, you know, providing what we call that evidence informed information so that they actually can, you know, next time round, uh, know where to get help. Um, and often I think uh, families will seek out uh, the doctors who are supportive of what, what they're looking for. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good, uh, a, a good way of looking at it. So yes, I think everybody's got to, you know, take, make sure they keep away from conflict of interest um, and, and ensure that they're supporting um, best health practices. So which is, which is great. Um, if, you, um, if you could give us some key messages, what would you like to share with your colleagues? Well, I, I have a slide that I use in my um, educational sessions that are true life myths that have been propagated by doctors to their patients who happen to be other doctors. Okay. So it, it really breaks my heart when I read that list because, you know, for no other organ system would we sit there and make proclamations about, for instance, the kidney function in a person mm -hmm. based on whatever our attitudes or whatever interpretation we have of our own life experiences, but this happens over and over again. So my main message when I give these uh, talks is to first do no harm. Yep. And if you don't know, know where to find out the answer. And that's been such a good thing for me with the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, because I'll say to the moms, look, you know, she'll ask something or we'll get into some situation. I'll say, look, I'm not actually sure, but I have 800 fellow members of this organization, doctors from around the world, and I have the facility to present that dilemma to these people online, and I will get some feedback from people that have had you know, similar experiences to me or more experience or what have you. So, I mean, this is, this is something that we have to watch out for in medical practice all the time. We have to give evidence-based answers. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so just giving the basic information and what you don't know, don't make it up. Yep. And I also make a big point of providing good resources to doctors so they have something that they can look at, mm -hmm. including, say, our clinical protocols that ABM has published on a lot of the topics that would relate very much to medical disciplines, but also things like where to get accurate information on medications and breastfeeding or um, reputable websites that they can use and educational courses like yours <laughs> but a lot of them that are available around the world if you yes. really feel you want to know more yeah you know yeah. There, uh, there was another recent study done in the uk that they looked at medical students 
and uh, you know what is happening is there is there change happening in medical school and there seems to be so they said like 98 percent of the students that they surveyed said that breastfeeding was important but they still rated themselves as poor to be able to help mothers mm -hmm. and provide the practical hands-on information that they might need. So as I say to people, one of my objectives in the course is to not feel like running away when breastfeeding mother and infant come into your practice and to try to be, you know, so that, they, that their source of information is not by Googling blogs. Yeah. We want to give them clinical, evidence-based, good information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no, nobody's going to um, be unhappy if you say, look, I don't know, but I'd love to find out the answer to that. Yeah, I think that's probably the key message that, um, I, I, that parents appreciate is that none of us know it all. And I think uh, being able to, you know, I think they actually have a higher respect um, uh, for, um, uh, you know, the health professionals that they work with when they actually say, hey, this is something that is new. Um, I'm going to search it out and making sure that they follow up. I think that's a that's a, a really kind of good uh, a good way of going about it. So, um, anything else you'd like to share? Mention, yeah. yeah, I want to mention with the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, their clinical protocols. You don't have to join the organization; no. they're free to download and free to share. And yeah. so, you know, for the anesthetist or the surgeon or the general practitioner or the pediatrician, the neonatologist, there's really good evidence based guidelines which are updated every five years with you know people that work in the field and are very intent on making our levels of evidence very obvious through the documents so they're hard earned and worked on documents before they get to publication and that's really you know regardless of whether you want to join another organization that is available to doctors and and really anyone to download to yeah. pass on to your doctor if you want. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a, it, the, the protocols are something that we use all the time, and I, and I I think as you know, um, working in our field, they're really important. That often we'll share with parents to take to their doctors, so that the doctor, you know, so they actually have this is this is evidence that's here, so that they've actually got some tools to help themselves um, uh, to work with their doctors um, also. So uh, no, that's great. Any final words? Oh, no, I'm always interested, as you said, in having people who want some clinical experience come and spend time with me. And I've made that obvious and, and inviting to people whenever I present. And uh, it's, it's really great to have um, a, a colleague with me that will actually maybe challenge me as well for information, but, you know, look at things in a new way. So, yeah, and I think all of us that are in breastfeeding medicine feel very strongly about mentoring and succession planning because, yes. Carol, we're not getting any younger. No, we're not. <laughs> no, we, we, want to, we want to make sure that our whole uh, knowledge base and our, our enthusiasm for the field is continued on. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. I agree. Thank you so much, um, uh, Yvonne. It's always wonderful um, to speak with you. I gosh, wish I could be in New Zealand eventually when all this is over. Um, but it's lovely to catch up with you again. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks <laughs> Take care well. now. Bye. Bye.